Wait a minute. Can we explore your uh, Jamie as George Costanza theory a little more? Do you think like Jamie, when he's like in the hot pool? with Brienne, like all his junk is like really hanging low and he's like i was in the pool he's like, like the, 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 does thou ladies know about the shrinkage <laughs> 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 of King's Grave uh, for our 32nd episode in the great linear reread through Song of Ice and Fire. My name is Adam, also known as Drown Snow on the forums. I will be your host for the evening, and I am joined by... Hey, this is Varley on the forums. Hey, it's Hannah in real life, Shadow Baby on the forums. Hi, everyone. It's uh, Mary in real life, and uh, I'm Mary on the forums. And I believe we might have one or two vassals uh, lurking around that will pop their heads in later. All right, so um, we are going to be covering uh, the period of September 15th of 299 through September 18th of 299. Um, last episode ended on the 12th of September with uh, John talking to Bran as a weirwood tree. <laughs> the next day on September 13th, Rob turns 16, and two days later, uh, Cat frees Jamie here. On the- and we will skip one chapter in the published order to get there. So the first chapter we have up is, let's see, Cat 7 from A Clash of Kings. Yes, uh, so here we go. Uh, so Cat 7, um, so Cat and Brienne are eating alone in the Great Hall of Riverrun while everyone else celebrates Rob's and Edmure's victories. Um, Cat learned earlier that Theon killed Bran and Rickon and uh, she's overwhelmed by grief. She tells Brienne about her sons and reminisces about them before suddenly talking about Arya and Sansa. She asks Brienne to come with her to the dungeons at midnight. Meanwhile, she goes to see her father, but but he is asleep. Um, She sits with him for hours until Brienne comes to tell her midnight has come. They get down to the dungeons where Kat orders Brienne to see that she's not disturbed and she enters Jamie's cell. So the wine she sent him earlier has been left untouched. We get a pretty dark description of Jamie, a shaggy beard, long um, unwashed hair, clothes uh, rotting. The chains don't allow him, allow him to stand or lie, or lie down comfortably. He's been left in the dark. He is arrogant and insulting still, suggesting that Cat came to have pleasure of him. Uh, Kat is revolted and tells him that she needs to know some things. He refuses to tell her anything, but as she leaves, he calls her back, offering to answer her questions if she answers his. In the following back and forth between the two, Jamie admits to being the father of Cersei's children and of pushing Bran from the window. In return, he learns that Tyrion, Cersei and Tywin are alive. However, he denies sending the assassin to kill Bran and confirms that the dagger wasn't won by Tyrion at the tournament, but by Robert. All this contradicts Peter's story and Kat sees that something is amiss, but Tyrion and Jaime tell the same tale. A little later in the dialogue, we get the famous line, so many vows that no matter what you do, you're forsaking one of the other. Um... Kat calls Jamie Kingslayer and he tells her the truth about um, how Ned's father and brother died. She is horrified, but she doesn't think uh, it changes anything to Jamie's character. He tells her that he was more loyal to Cersei than Ned was to her and that, in any case, Littlefinger had her first. She calls for Brienne and asks for her sword. And that's the end of chapter. Nicely done. Did did anyone think that she, she actually killed him? I don't remember what I thought. <laughs> I, the first I thought, time obviously, cried, like, they did, yeah. I mean, all his answers were just so honest, but kind of flippant at the same time. That it's just like, I, I figured uh, she she just killed him. I don't know. That was my first reread. Or reread. I, I kind of did. I had seen yeah. the show, like, through this part already before I read it. Oh. So I thought, oh, is this like where it starts to kind of majorly break away? But then I like once again, the show is ruining your experience. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, no, because it. I mean, I no, I, I, I thought, know. okay, it's 
maybe it's different, you know. So yeah, I was I was kind of a little nervous for him. I mean, I didn't really like him at this point, so not that nervous. He does make a good point about all the vows, and I think it's kind of been talked to death. But you know, this is where you hear the first time where he's like, "Oh, so many vows they make you say." I agree. Titles, titles, titles. Um, <laughs> but this like, whole dialogue. It, it's, it's, yeah, yeah, go it's, ahead, it's, 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 it's very interesting dialogue. And um, for people like me, like I picked up the books, like after the first episode, I like started reading them basically right away. And so not having to kind of wait between books, maybe you don't get the full effect of this because it's like, oh, and then you just keep reading. And then you put, you know, I found out very quickly, you know, what had happened. Um but, I mean, I'm sure that the people who, you know, read this when it was published and then read the next book had kind of a different experience with this chapter than a lot of us did. Yeah, I, th- I mean, this has to be, like, the same thing as, like, Brienne yelling out a word, right? Or, like, Brienne yeah, picking up... I mean, it's supposed to be a cliffhanger, right? So Yeah. So now, years later, we still don't... We, we can guess at what's going to be happening, but, like... We have no idea. Yeah, but so yeah, Bina, for... Bina put in a couple of notes here, um, which are interesting. So um, she said there's, you know, foreshadowing of um, Lady Stoneheart, maybe. I can see that. Um, Kat says, um, you know, what God would let this happen about Bran and Rickon being murdered. But, you know, perhaps she should have had more faith. Uh, but they have, you know, answered her prayers. And she doesn't realize it. Uh, she's, she never finds that out uh, to this point anyway. In the books. So this is the beginning of Brienne and Jamie's relationship, right? Um, uh, 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 yeah, their interactions. More yeah, in the I next chapter. Had they even really ever met before all of this? I'm trying to remember. I don't, I don't think, think so. One thing being asked and is kind of a question that I always um, wondered is, did Kat really know she was going to free him when she, like, what was her intention going down there? Was she thinking, kill him, free him? Was, she just had no clue, and she just felt that she needed to go down there? Like, what, what was her plan? I don't know. I mean, it, I it feels it, it feels because we're, we're, we're left up in the air, so it feels like maybe it was supposed to be kind of fluid, and, um, like, maybe she just kind of didn't know and was playing it by ear, but... I think she just wanted, like, straight answers. Yeah, but I, I also think she kind of thought about uh, freeing him from the beginning, even if she wasn't sure she would do it. Because earlier she's mentioning Sansa and Arya, and, and, and we see that it's it's um, it's hard for her. She really wants, she, I mean, the death of Bran and Rickon, it's, um, uh, she, she takes it really hard. And that's when she starts uh, thinking about how to free her daughters. So she might... She, I, I think she at least had the idea. She just kind of kept her options open, I guess. So let's see, I'm looking here, I'm trying to see, because um, right now we've got, um, this is, you know, a late uh, Clash of Kings chapter, and we get a lot of bleed over into um, Storm of Swords now, but there's still, I mean, it's, it's going to take, you know, it's a, it's a little while before we actually finish out all the Clash of Kings chapters. So, for Kat. it's just interesting, for, well, just for everyone. Um, and this is her last chapter, right? Because we have Cat One next um, coming up. Yes. Oh right, right, right. From Storm of Swords, yeah. So I mean, we have you know we have Jamie One, Cat One. These are all coming up. Um, but you're looking like there's a lot that happens in the timeline uh, further on down the line before we get back to this um, after Cat One, I think. So it's just kind of interesting, kind of interesting how this all lays out. Um, Within, within that time frame there. But, uh, I don't know, this was definitely, I mean, and this is, you know, we can start the cat hate or whatever. I mean, what, you know, this is kind of one of the biggest um, points of contention as to, like, whether cat was, was you know, did good, did bad, whatever. I mean, this is kind of the major decision that she makes that affects a lot of things. So, um, I mean... What do we feel about her her motivations? Her, what 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 do we think that she thinks would happen here? Like you know, does she really you know does she really feel this is positive? Um, I, know, I think she has to, right? Or else she's just a freaking jerk. And I will start. Yeah. That. It's <laughs> funny because this is the one action that she does that I like completely understand and agree with her on, and all the cat lovers like. It's usually if they love Cat, they hate 
that she did this, and I literally hate every single other thing she does, and I understand this one right here. I mean, she's backed into a corner. I get it. Well, I mean, from from her with her current mental state, it makes sense, you know, emotionally, all that yada yada. Yeah. But like, does it, like, how does it make sense? Like, that, you know, do you really trust that this is going to happen? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think it's a leap is, of is faith, she, is she, but it, but is she just like, it's being, a calculated risk? It's a hail mary kind of. Huh? It's just mm-hmm. kind of like, well, if it, I mean, if it works, I hopefully I get my children back. But um, uh, how much oh, totally. do you she, think she's expecting it to work? She, she she knows she's in the shit for doing this, right? I mean, she she's accepted that the responsibility that like what she's doing is wrong. Is it bad for Rob's cause? But it's to get her daughters back. Like it's it yeah. just benefits her. Yeah, but I think she. I mean, I think it's interesting that what what do we think would have happened if Brienne had. Um, um, succeeded in taking in taking Jamie to King's Landing, and uh, if Tyrion had still kind of been in charge there, uh, I think he would have kept his word, and I think she was right in in trusting uh, Tyrion Tyrion on this. I mean, I don't know, but and I mean, she she clearly thinks uh, that Tyrion is going to keep his word, even though she doesn't believe in Jamie as much. Well, uh, but also, like, you know, it, him ha- uh, him being Rob, having um, Jamie, you know, prevents any Red Wedding, right? Because, like, an action like the Red Wedding would never happen if they could chop off uh, Jamie's head. Right? Tywin would never risk oh, it. Yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, there's absolutely no way. The Red Wedding um, maybe is capturing Rob and... You know, at the most, and then now right. we have a hostage. You have a hostage. We do an exchange. There's, there's exactly. no chopping, uh, chopping his head off and murdering everyone on the table. Um, Bruce Bolton yeah, is not sure. old enough to do that. No one does that. <coughs> right. Yeah, she's she's giving Tyrion too much credit too. Like Joffrey would have probably never allowed Sansa to go. You know. Yeah, but what does this say? I mean, is this more um, of an indictment of? kind of cats, you know, mental state and saying like, oh, you know, she, you know, she was just hoping that Tyrion would do it. Or does it, does this really give Tyrion some credit um, for people that, you know, are able to view him um, objectively that kind of realize that, you know, yeah, he, he, maybe he is kind of a better person to deal with than, uh, than the rest of the Lannisters and maybe he will follow through and, you know, because he's, Tyrion's not known as a liar or a cheater. He's just that, you know, he's the despicable door for whatever, you know the the rumors that they circulate and all that. Um, that's you know yeah, but the, the common folk, the the actual lords and people that have had dealings with him haven't had any of that, right? Well, I think that that's exactly right because I mean she's basing it off of all the time they spent together, going to the Erie and everything else. That he's not one to be like kind of like mince words, you know. Whatever he's like, I, you know, it's not it wasn't my knife, like. You know, I would never bet against my family, and now he's getting. Yeah. Now she's getting confirmation of this yeah. from Jamie that, you know, he he, even under duress, like he's not lying. And so yeah, it seems like he stuck to his guns even when there was no reason to, and you know he he was a bit you know I mean he's Tyrion about it right, but um right. yeah. you know and it probably is hard for her to accept because she immediately wanted to be like that's his knife, little finger took her in that way, uh, right. point her in that way, but then she realized that little finger betrayed you know. Um, Ned, and you know, I think it's maybe like it's hard for her to admit, but she came to kind of realize, like, okay, well, maybe maybe this wasn't anything to do with Tyrion. Well, uh, just you know, watching the trial by combat up at the Erie, too, you know, like he kept to his word and paid, um, what's the dude's name, Morg, Morg or whatever, yeah, yeah, Morg. like he pays oh. him, like, like, like he says. And when Lys is trying to, you know, oh, that wasn't fair. And Kat's like, oh, no, it was. And you got to let him go. You know, I mean, I don't think that she's insane. I I really a lot of times think that she's stupid and could have avoided <laughs> a lot of this mess with other better choices. But I mean, yeah, that's just me. Yeah. Like not kidnapping uh, Tyrion to begin with. Yeah, like yeah, well, not leaving again, Winterfell but, to begin with. 
Yeah, that's my biggest I mean, thing with her. I think all of stay your ass at home. You're probably right, you know, in of course hindsight, but all of those decisions make sense narratively, um, especially yeah. like grabbing Tyrion, all of that. She's just like, I mean, you know, it's like you, you know, Ned's like you're creating an international incident, you know. I don't got, <laughs> now I gotta go meet with the the prime minister of uh, you know Lannisport or whatever, you know. Um, but to her, it's like, oh well, when are we gonna get this opportunity, you know? And as yeah. you know, she had information from someone that she you know had no reason not to really trust. Um, so. so uh, uh, she like is her action bit, is her action here like um like equating to like a three AM tweet? Like uh <laughs> it, it's early, it's late you know, no, it's no, a wee hours I, of the morning. That's thing. I'm gonna do I, something I, stupid that'll cause maybe yeah, yeah. Cause, cause she's she she does things that are maybe kind of stupid with good information and good intentions and you know, maybe she's just kind of, you know, missing some pieces or whatever. Um, versus Cersei, who like is her own enemy, right? She creates her own problems. Yeah. Um, Cat doesn't do that. So I mean, that's. But I that's think both good. of them think what they're doing, you know, really is in their self interest and is the right thing to do. Like Cersei's a fucking idiot, but I don't think she ever doubts like what she's doing is right. like the wrong thing to do. Well, like she's like, no, this is. Kat, they're all. Kat knows, does well, love her well, children. Kat knows this isn't right. I mean, as far as, like, for the cause, she knows this, this isn't right. This isn't going to benefit Rob. Well, and she knows so, it's treason. She's not delusional about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but she, I mean, she thinks, oh, because I'm the king's mom, I can get away with it. Like, like, if she was anyone else, she'd know that was her head right there. You know? Right, I mean, and it's like... like look at what w- happens to the, the car start. Just, you know? And that's a whole other, that's a whole other issue of... Uh, is that a mistake? I mean, the car—the whole issue with the car Starks. Um, oh yeah. It's like Rob had to do it, but he also shouldn't have done it. And you know, we've had this discussion I think several times. But do you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's on that such level. Such a rough situation. Of, yeah, yeah. You went against your liege lord, and not just your liege lord, your now crowned sovereign. Yeah, and it's his mother, and you he know. really, you know, can't be shown. He can't be treating her too leniently, or else that's going to look bad to the other to the other lords. And he, I mean, he. He put her in such an impossible position with this, which really compromised his cause, unfortunately. Um, yeah. Yeah. It would be interesting if we did have, like, a Rob chapter just to see that conflict. Like, we kind of see it on the outside through Cat, like, with uh, Jane Westerling being like, yeah, he, he like he's all upset about this Car Stark thing. Like, why is he killing his yeah. old men? When, you know, every, he let his every, mother uh, go. You know, Every Rob chapter would just be him staring into a mirror, doing his hair, and just being like, uh, why, why, why is everyone making it hard work for me? All I do is win the battles, and and people just want to give me more headaches. So, will someone just do something right for once, other than me? Dear diary, I have more pews. Maybe, maybe he's just like Hodor, and his chapter would just be Jane Westerling tips, Jane Westerling tips, Jane Westerling yeah. tips. Anyway, um, so. I mean, if we'll, we can talk a little bit more about this, obviously, in the next cat chapter. Um, so, is there anything else specifically we want to say about this, or should we move on? Um, yeah. Did you guys, when you were reading this, did you realize that it was Joffrey who sent the knife, or did you still not here? know? No, not here. No, I, no definitely. I, I don't think I knew until Tyrion figured it out, and I still yes. don't think I'd have any, any reason to. You know, foresee it being Joffrey that's sent the knife. Did you have any other ideas? Because I think when when I was reading, it, I finger? straight up thought it was Littlefinger. Yeah, yeah, yeah I Littlefinger. Mean, little, Littlefinger is the one that gave the information that turned out to be you know misleading and betrayed Ned, and so I think you know all signs point to him at this point. So yeah. And then my other thing was, I think it's really sad this chapter because I understand cats. I'll use a Bina word, invidious position here. She lost her kids. Oh, no, Is no, that what she says, right? again. Yes, that's <laughs> what she says. <laughs> An impossible situation. She's lost her two youngest kids. And she at least knows where Rob is and what he's doing, even if he's not exactly safe. And then no, she, she thinks lost her husband. Her she got bad information about her two younger kids. Well, yeah, she but I mean, like from what she, she knows, right? Something stupid. But 
but she's thinking, okay, well, I'll at least get my girls back. And so even if this had been successful and Jamie got there and Tyrion did keep his word, the, it's so sad that she, like she doesn't realize they don't have Arya. And I wonder if she knew that or had an inkling of that, would she have acted differently here? Would well, she have? D- didn't she get like that sort of feeling from uh, Cleos? Like he mentioned Sansa, but never Arya. Yeah, and I think in a, in an earlier chapter, she says to she she tells Brienne, um, who have, no one knows where Arya is. I mean, she she she's not actually sure that the Lannisters have her. But hope is better than nothing, so she's still uh, she's still hoping to get them both back. Let's move on to the the next chapter, and then we'll uh, kind of loop back around to this in the in Cat One. All right. So we're leaving uh, uh, Clash of Kings and going to Storm of Swords. We are moving on uh, into Storm of Swords, the uh, first Jamie chapter, the first Jamie chapter. Um, Let's see, and that is Hannah. In our first ever inside glimpse of Jamie, Sir Jamie, the Kingslayer Lannister, we open with him, Brienne, and his cousin Sir Cleos Frey rowing in a small skiff down the Red Fork of the Trident. After having been freed from the dungeons of River Run by Cat in an effort to get the girls freed from the clutches of Cersei's claws. He watches Brienne's work at the oars, inwardly giving her an insulting assessment for her masculine figure. He offers to spell her at the oars if she unshackles him. She refuses. Some sharp words are exchanged, and he ultimately concedes and changes tact. He remembers Cersei being displeased with him for throwing Bran out the window. Cersei was sure they could have tricked or scared the seven-year-old boy into staying silent about what he may have saw. Jamie flippantly tells her that he'll gladly have their relationship made public and go to war over her cunt. After a time, they see the bodies of three whore, or three women hanging from a tree next to a burned out building that Cleos recalls was an inn. Brio decides that they must be cut down and buried with honor. Jamie advises that they do not stop, but Brian ignores him and hastens to climb the tree. The women bear a note of their conviction and death sentence. They lay with lions. Jamie laments that that's what whores do and that they died for doing their duty to men on the march. He also very interestingly thinks that Brienne is cruel to cut them down because crows must eat as well. The young lady of Tarth suddenly shouts for them to make back to the boat and the knights turn to see a cloud of red and blue sail on the horizon. As they flee the pursuing Tully River galley, Jamie chides that hopefully they'll stop to finish digging the horse graves for Brienne, and privately thinks of how Tyrion would be formulating a clever plan to secure their escape, whilst all he can strategize is grabbing a sword and fighting them, win or die. For nearly an hour, they are found in a twisting, turning game of cat and mouse with the galley as the river bends, cloak and un- unmask them over and over. Eventually, the galley catches up to them after Sir Cleos tiredly gives up hope at the oars and Jamie, Jamie's repeated offer to help Rose once again refused. Sir Robin Rygar, the captain of the Tolly Castle Guard, addresses the bandit party, ordering them to give up and come quietly, saying his orders are to take Jamie back alive if at all possible. He orders archers on the deck to not draw and loose. Arrows fly through the sail of the small yacht into her mast and very closely past Jamie himself. Their skiff, their skiff is once more a lauded cover in another wind of the water, and Brian orders Cleos to take the rudder from her, and she quickly disembarks, making for an island jutting from the river. She orders the fray to give Jamie an oar and climbs and begins to climb a cliff face. Jamie is grateful for the weapon and the two men continue in their chase. The Tully Vesso rounds the island and approaches once more. Jamie shouts to Sir Robin to distract him from spying Brian's ascension and offers to fight him in chains for his freedom. His trick is successful for as the archers are loosing another flock of 
closer range arrows at them. Brian knocks a boulder from the cliff and it smashes into their deck, disabling the river craft. For a moment, Jamie thinks he's free and clear of Lady Catelyn's sworn shield as well as her father's men. But Brian strides across the top of the cliff and dives into the water to catch up with her query and company. Jamie proves he has some measure of a conscience and in his heart and head decides it would be wrong to hope stone. Instead, he idles as Cleos turns their craft toward her and not being able to let a minute pass, being too honorable, poises himself to bash her skull in with his oar as soon as she is in range. Instead, he finds himself lowering it to help her back onto the boat, marveling at the wonder she is for swearing her oath and having the lady balls to keep it. End of. So did you use a thesaurus for boat? Because we got yacht, vessel, skiff, boat. Yeah, you just got to mix yeah. it up. Um, <laughs> so, the only thesaurus I need is in River my galley. Mind. <laughs> um, actually, it's it's words he uses in throughout the chapter, so yeah, I just kind of right. yeah, I just kind of followed him to mix it up, you know. So you're not saying the you same know, word you over. Know Matt. I mean, if you'd done the reading, you'd you'd know this. Um. Uh, I have done the reading. <laughs> I'm Shut messing up. with you. <laughs> All right, <stop. laughs> but um, um, so this is actually the the day after. Um, the last chapter we just had, but it's like t almost 200 pages. It's 15 chapters into Storm of Swords before you get this, uh, before you get this moment. So, uh, where yeah. where I literally thought like this moment wouldn't have happened because I thought Jamie was dead. My first read. Yeah, so I, was like, I mean you, you're oh. well into it. You're well into it, and you're like Jamie won. Oh, huh. Interesting. Yeah, I was really surprised is to see a POV of him. Like, I read the prologue and then flipped and I was like, oh, shit. Yeah. Um, yeah, and he really is just a prick, isn't he? Like, well, right I mean, now, kind he's of. Right now, he's his head the entire time, he's just like, he's just a prick. Here he's still, you know, bad Jamie, but, I mean, he has a certain logic and a certain code that he does kind of live by and you start to see it here. You know, he's like, you kind of get it in the last chapter. My sister's vagina. He's like, I'll throw <laughs> her a cunt. Like, that's, well, that's I mean, he truly, or at least thinks he truly loves her. I mean, it's like in the last chapter when he tells Kat, and he is a dick for saying it, but it's kind of true. I mean, he's been more faithful with Cersei than, you know, your honorable Ned has been. He doesn't know the whole thing with John, but based on what they both know in that yeah, situation. Well, it, I mean, he's he right. So, right. You know? yeah, yeah. But, and, and, and um, like the, you know, being a, being a pulled this quote, which is kind of funny, um, you know, it says, you know, an, an east wind blew through his tangled hair as soft and fragrant as Cersei's fingers, you know? So he's like, you know, he's still, uh, he views Cersei in a way that she clearly doesn't really view him, but, you know, he, he romanticizes their whole relationship as much as he's yeah. kind of a dick. But he also thinks about Tyrion too you know like Tyrion would do this and you know uh, when he's judging Cleos for being kind of a weasel and a fool you know he's very family oriented so it's weird seeing him mashed up with somebody like Kat who's also very family oriented and makes all her choices based off her family and he does too it's just in what we know to be a perverse way in a gross way. But, well, both yeah. of them, if you figure, because, I mean, her family is the offspring of her, her coupling with her brother, which is, you know, it's nice and gross. Mm. I mean, it's, you start to get the inclination, though, of him being a human in this chapter and not mm. just this you know, Gaston type guy running through the streets of King's Landing starting fight. Yes. Sorry, I'm gonna try to mute myself. I'm watching the Giants. They just scored a touchdown. No. Oh, God. Um about 
this chapter and also the previous one, um, I think uh, we see that uh, he's been he's been in prison for for quite a while, right? I'm not sure of the exact time frame, but um, I mean we see that it it, it has taken. Uh, it's toll on on him physically and also mentally. I mean, with with Cat, he's he's a dick, but he also wants to talk to someone. That's uh, he 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 calls her back and stuff like that. And um, I mean, he got himself in that situation. But he imprisonment had has been hard. I think it's the beginning of the change for him already being him imprisoned for so long. Yeah, and I almost I meant to bring this up in the last chapter, but like, was he really like he's he's obviously just goading Cat, but like, was he really expecting that maybe that she wanted to sleep with him? You know, next to like, women like to fuck next to a bucket full of shit, like through the sun bathed <laughs> person. Like, what? I, I don't think he was expecting she really wanted that, <laughs> but <laughs> he, he says it. <laughs> yeah, but he <laughs> he says a lot of things. That's fair. Yeah. So Brienne in the show is very attractive. From what Jamie's thinking in his head, she is Fuggles, right? Oh, from what everyone thinks in their heads, she's Fuggles. Like, like when Cat first sees her, you know. I was watching yeah, a YouTube it's... video the other day of like what Game of Thrones actors should have looked like, and they did. They did Brienne, and it was pretty funny. Oh god, it must have been awful. They like photoshopped Gwendolyn Christie's face, and she looked like she got smacked with Deliverance. Oh Jesus! <laughs> it, was, it was awful. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> All right. Um, there was, speaking of the show, I really wish that they had done uh, this whole thing with her going up the cliff and letting that boulder down on the show as opposed to the stupid fight between her and Jamie on that bridge. Uh, oh, yeah, I guess they didn't have the chase, but... The show didn't have Cleos either, right? Right, like it's some other homie, and he kills him. And right. well, they're right. never at River Run either. I mean, it's all so different. This is when I started to realize, oh, okay, we're really breaking away here. We're... Right. I think that this between the end of Storm, or sorry, the end of Clash and the beginning of Storm is when they take their separate paths. Pretty good. Yeah, that's right, right? Uh, they, they, the first season and first book are pretty, yeah. you know, pretty spot on. And then yeah, then they diverge after that. To be fair, though, to them, I think, because this all takes place, all of the events before they get captured by the Brave Companions is like, what, four or five, six chapters? So they condensed it down to basically two, three scenes. Right, that's right. By doing it differently. So I kind of understand, but I just wish that we could have seen her being a badass, like scaling a cliff, you know, you know, Red Pirate Robert status or Black Pirate Robert status and then knocking the boulder down. Style? Yeah, style. I think it would have been cool, though, to see. Definitely would have yeah. been cool. Cool, and also we. I mean, I might have understood better what she did because just reading it, I don't know if I just don't um, vi visualize things uh, the right way in my head. But I'm like, um, I don't see how that goes exactly. <laughs> he definitely didn't describe it as well as say like a feast <laughs> of any yeah. kind. Yeah, yeah, right. Yes. Or or two pumps of having sex. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Drogo's seed. Yeah. <laughs> so, do you think, like, I mean, does, uh, Kat's in a bad space right now. When she learns that, like, her person wrecked a boat and maybe killed a couple more Tully men, like, uh, like there's, she, she doesn't even get punished for that. Yeah, I mean, the whole thing's going tits up at this point. <laughs> like, it really has. Like, nothing is going according to plan, so stop making plans. 
do you think the Red Wedding was planned after they lost Cleo's fray and they're like they blame that on uh on Kat and Brienne? Oh, that's an interesting. Okay, that's, that's my crackpot theory. Is if Cleos had made it to King's Landing, the phrase would never have turned on him. But because they're so tight knit clan, that once they found out that Brienne and Cat had killed one, or thought that they had killed one, they turned against him. Oh. I don't think so. I think it would have happened anyway. So I don't. Yeah, I don't think Walder values like some rando <laughs> relation of his all that much. Dude, yeah. it, Cle- Cleos Frey was the Frey that. You know, join the Freys and Lannisters, right? Technically, yeah. it's, it's 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 his father, right? Who's married to um, the uh, Tywin sister? Cleo's yeah, Jenna. is just or Gemma. Yes, Jenna? Gemma. Uh, yeah. With M's, um, Cleo's is uh, Jamie's cousin, and, yeah. and re- really, I don't think Walder Frey is uh, w- would would care about just uh, an offshoot. Uh, I mean, he. I mean, I think the marriage, uh, Rob's marriage, is really the thing that sets him off, and it would have even if uh, Cleos, Cleos hadn't been killed. Well, the I other disagree. thing is, I'm, I'm believing my own Kool Aid. This is a thing. This is a theory that's going to happen. Well, the thing, <laughs> the thing is, is like uh, that marriage took place back when the Lannisters, Starks. Baratheons, like everybody's cool in a time of peace, you know, and they're already married when the phrase declare for Rob. But Cleos and, didn't, right? But Cleos didn't, yeah. So I just, I don't know how much bearing that has on the ultimate. If, and if Shaggy Dog can have R plus L equals G, <laughs> give me this. What's more likely? Hey, I'm about R plus L equals D, too. Oh, my God. What do you think, Nymeria? R plus L equals D or my theory? Uh, your theory. But, yes. Uh, <laughs> but that just because Adam? R, plus, R plus L equals D, no. <laughs> Doesn't make any goddamn sense. Adam, what's your vote? Oh, yeah, give me one second. Jock? Is Jock back on? Yep. What do you think is more likely, my theory or the R plus L equals D? Neither. But which is more likely? (laughs) (laughs) R plus L equals D? (laughs) Mic drop. Go back to your tunnel. (laughs) Maybe you should get in the tunnel, and then you'll know the truth about R plus L equals D. All right, all right, I apologize about that, guys. Um, yeah, then the no, we apologize. Of course, Tell tell Adam your awesome theory. That Cleo's fray, without the death of Cleo's fray, there would have been no red wedding, without because the death that of death Cleo's fray, right, by the hands mm-hmm. of Cat and Brienne. Yeah, yeah. So that's my theory. That's my new theory that I'm going to champion. <laughs> and I'm saying, what's more likely, my theory or R plus L equals D? And so far, um, I have Hannah and a Scotsman saying R plus L equals D. I, and I just, the I, only I, I, truly I, smart I, person, Nymeria, has backed my cause. <laughs> I, I'm going to have to say that I, um, I'm the deciding vote here. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm going to have to say that I think... I just don't believe R plus L equals C, and that's something that we will definitively get an answer to, so I think that's going to be a no. And uh, your theory is probably something that uh, we'll always be able to debate and is more likely to have um, truth involved in it. Very diplomatic. <laughs> yes, very carefully <laughs> said. <laughs> oh, I've, been, I've been carefully saying a lot of things this week. Ah, uh, so. yes. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, I, I could see that. I could definitely see that. Um, I don't see Daenerys being. This is bullshit. What? I'm just just kidding. Uh, I mean, the only, the only theory to me that makes sense is if Daenerys and Jon are somehow twins, like the twin theory. I thought, I I thought it's kind of cool, but there's so many little details that don't make sense. 
Um, and, and I mean, John, that's the sort of thing where it can Harry? just be mis- it could just be incorrect information and all that in the book. So like, you know, that sort of thing could maybe be justified somehow in the book, but I, you know, I doubt it. I thought the theory was that John and Mira were twins. Well, that's the other like that's the really crazy one that uh, what <laughs> you know people are just people are just having fun there. Um, yeah, that like Helen Reed took there were two babies, and so Helen Reed took took one of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so because the other thing would be like if Daenerys, you know, if Daenerys is a twin, like why is he taking John and not Daenerys, right? Right. Uh, that that doesn't make any sense. So it, it, I think it would be cool, you know. And then of course they're going to end up getting married, you know, because that's what Targaryens do. Um, so everything still ends up the same. It doesn't really change anything, uh, you know. Right. Uh, king and queen on the throne uh, at the end of the book. Um, all right, are we uh, are we done with uh, Jamie one, or do we have anything more to say? Um, I think we're done. I have one one last tiny thing. Um, I just think it's it's interesting that we get the first kind of flashback of Jamie and Cersei together, and uh, I don't know, it gets us more insight on their relationship, which is always interesting. Mm. But that's it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, their relationship is kind of, you know, it's supposed to, it's meant to be icky and, you know, like, you know, it offends our kind of sensibility and all that. But, you know, there's, at least for, for Jamie's, you know, part, there does seem to be kind of something noble um, in there. Yeah, there's there's definitely so, actual love, I think, from Jamie. Yeah. So. It's not just the squid babies. So, um. This, this, this was also <laughs> the first time I realized, like. <laughs> Cersei's not just straight up like psycho cocaine crazy like with her going why the fuck did you push that kid out the window like we could have taken oh, care yeah, of yeah, it yeah. you yeah, moron she's kind of the, Never he's like, thing. and he's just like well I kind of thought I had to kill a kid I don't know I mean I was like I'm <laughs> discovered was that the wrong call I mean I you not didn't want that. me to kill a little kid you know, I feel like you know you ever what you know if you're familiar with Seinfeld you know George is like, should I not have done that? Was that not the right call? Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's so kind of how I, forward, I, imagine, I don't imagine do that. Jamie, you know, as George Costanza. Because, <laughs> you know, I got I got to plead ignorance here. If pushing the kid <laughs> out the window wasn't right, I didn't know. Um, <laughs> but uh, anyway, let's uh, let's move on to um, to Cat One from A Storm of Swords. And this is, let's see, where do we jump? It's the same day as Jamie won. So, and this is still, uh, yeah, this is, these are back-to-back chapters in the book. Wait a minute, can we explore but, your uh, Jamie as George Costanza theory a little more? Do you think, like, Jamie, when he's, Jamie like, in Costanza. the hot pool with Brienne, like, all his junk is, like, really hanging low, and he's like, I was in the pool. He's like, like the, 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 doth thou ladies know about the shrinkage? <laughs> 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 but you know what? I mean, you know, <laughs> Jamie has the flowing locks of hair, so you know he doesn't really have to compensate for anything. He doesn't have to worry. You know, he he doesn't even need one hand, uh, right? You know, the, you know, one-handed. Yeah, uh, he's still a greater right? swordsman than most people in the land. Right? So, uh, do you do you imagine like uh, when they find out somebody sends a knife after Bran? It's like that scene in Seinfeld. Where they're out in LA and they're like, because the murderer struck again. Have you ever seen it? <laughs> Thank you for calling Raven Phone. <laughs> Why don't you just tell me what castle you want to reach? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to reach Lannisport. <laughs> uh, this is you, you, you've you selected <laughs> Brown Eyed Girl. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, Seinfeld. Um, you anyway. selected Jane Westerling Tips. <laughs> You've selected R plus L equals question mark. If this is correct. <laughs> Why don't you just tell me what crazy theory you selected? Uh, no bowl of brown for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Why isn't there like a uh, uh, Seinfeld Westeros Tumblr or something? We're doing uh, it right now. We need, this needs we need, to be a thing. We need, we need to meme this up. We need to make it happen. Um, okay. Anyway, so... Um, Let's move on to uh, Cat One from A Storm of Swords. Uh, yes. This is a consecutive chapter in the book. It's about 200 pages in the book. 
Um, so, you know, right after Jamie won. And uh, let's see. We have uh, Sir Desmond and Uthride Swain, which uh, Roto Treese pronounces as Arthurize. Arthurize Swain. I don't know why he says that. Um, they meet with Catelyn and try to decide uh, what was to be done with her. Uh, she, you know, obviously she didn't run or try to hide it or anything. I think she just straight up was like, here's what I did, you know, once Jamie was on the way out. Um, they do not want to put her in chains because that, you know, looks really bad and everything. They decide that, that she must be confined uh, to a cell until Edmure returns. She suggests her father's chambers um, so instead she can comfort him in her final days. And everyone agrees to that because they're all decent people. Um, Lord Hosser is sleeping when Catelyn arrives in his chambers. He wakes up, and when she speaks and calls uh, calls her Tansy, she doesn't know who this is. And um, Catelyn asks, uh, Hoster answers that she will have many trueborn sons. Um, then she asks the maester if he knows any Tansy, but he does not. She's all really concerned about this tansy chick. I think she probably thinks it's a mistress or something. I don't really know. Caitlin notices the arrival of a raven and asks about the news. Uh, the maester tells her it is from Rob. He has stormed the crag, which is all going to work out really well for him, I believe. Um, it's not that big of a deal. And uh, Caitlin puzzles on what her father said uh, and concludes that Lysa must have lost a child before Lord Hoster. Uh, made her marry John Aaron. Um, and let's see, she writes a letter to Lysa urging her to come or at least send a letter and gives it to the maester, you know, because her father is dying and, you know, it's the last chance to see her father, etc. So, uh, what do we think? So, I don't know. I don't like this chapter. Sorry, I'm just still thinking it's about like, Seinfeld it's a, very pr- <laughs> it's a very procedural chapter, right? You know? I mean, you know, right. a lot of it's a it's a chapter about nothing. Am I right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, it's it's just sort of like all of this. I mean, except for the the bit about Tansy and kind of laying that out. Really, this all is like off screen stuff that could have happened. I mean, not that it's you know a waste of a chapter or anything, but this is just like you assumed. You know, she was going to talk to them and they were going to have to put her somewhere, you know, hold her somewhere and yeah, figure out what's going on, yada, yada, yada. Um, and we get the, you know, it's exposition, you know, we get the information about the crag, which is significant. Um, Tansy, what else is there? Um, so do you think that Kat's having like a hard time, like, or moving forward with just trusting men? Because... First, Ned comes back with a bastard, and then all of a sudden she thinks her father was, like, sleeping around with this girl named Tansy, and, like, do you think that affects her moving forward? Yeah, and, well, like, her son you? has a marriage pact that he violates in a time of I war. think, un- unfortunately, um, the, the, the Ned bastard thing kind of did as much damage as was ever needed to be done there. Um, yeah. Like, but I thought and, somewhere and, it, and it's it, she, you know, and that's a little bit on her, you know, because like they barely knew each other, and he went off. Like, let's say it's all true, you know, they barely knew each other. He went off and got a, uh, he, he got a bastard, slept with someone else, and pretty much every other lord in the realm does far worse than that. And it doesn't seem like her dad was like some huge womanizer or anything that would really, like, I don't know where she would kind of have this issue that like it's just like the worst thing and. Like, how she hates uh, John so much and all that. Um, yeah, I don't know where all that comes from. Mm, interesting. I also, was really a, interested what, in the Tansy thing. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, no, so the Tansy thing, like, as a woman, she didn't pick up that, like, oh, maybe it's Tansy T, like, the abortive that I've taken before or that well, but some it's, girls it's, have taken before. It seems like it's probably because if you're only using it for a purpose like that, which is not... Um, you know, it's not reputable, right? So no one's going to talk about it. And there's not a lot of, like, resources for women in this world or for people in general. So I can very easily see that if she had never had occasion to, like, have a pregnancy that she didn't want it or know someone that had that situation, how she would just be completely ignorant of, of Tansy T and all that. Um, yeah, but I think, not, I mean... They, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't be like, oh, everyone knows you get Tansy T to get rid of those unwanted babies. You know, like... I feel like that's just people aren't going to be discussing that. It's not going to be something that 
people are going to be telling their kids, make sure, you know, you get that tansy tea if you ever get in trouble. Like, you know, like, that's just not. <laughs> I wonder that the, but it would be because like, in the society where you're supposed to like your marriage as like, you know, a virgin, you know, people are still having fun and, you know, need to get rid of any unwanted burdens that R- would. Well, I know, but, that, but that's what I'm saying is that because there's a, there's a need for it in this world and people, there are people that do know about it um, because of that. But there's also such a, a stress um, put on, you know, like, you know, virginity, you know, chastity, things like that. And so it's just not going to be discussed, you know, because I, mean, th- I mean, think about people even in our world, you know, when you talk about abortion and stuff and um, sex education and like they don't, you know, they don't want God. kids to, they don't want kids they to have condoms. Fun. Yeah. They're like, well, we don't want them to know condoms exist, you know, because then that will make them have sex, you know, like, so right, it's, that, it's that's sort of the same, it's the same sort of thing, you know. But I mean, that, I'm just saying that's how people think when, when yeah. you know, when that's the attitude they have towards matters like this. So I can totally understand <laughs> how most people just have no idea about this stuff. Do you think the fathers are just like, if, if my boy's having sex, I want him to feel it? That's why there's no condoms in school. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> Dragon skin condoms are just too expensive. No, because if that was the case, there'd be more uncircumcised boys. Oh boy. Are we talking in real world, or what are we talking about? Yes, we're talking in real world, I think. Oh. Kind of. Yeah, well. Yeah. We're going off the rails. Who's hosting this thing? It's as real as it gets on VOK. Yeah, so uh, we'll, we'll cut out all of the we uncomfortable had, uh, foreskin talk. Wait a minute, what are you going to do? Cut off? The intent? That, that, that was the, the, yeah, that was the joke. Um, okay. I, I just, uh... It just kind of slipped through there, I guess. Anyway, um... There's another Seinfeld thing, that episode of the Moyle. Um, the Briss. That's, uh... That sounds rough. Sounds rough. <laughs> yes. So, you gotta really uh, believe in your religion. Well, but to be like... Yeah, I mean, I understand a lot of people have it done for reasons, but, like, to be the, the dude that has to go around doing it, be like, no, no, nope, nope. Not me. You know, and I, I spend all day, you know, staring at, you know, blood and guts and organs and things. So, uh, yeah. Wait, you do? Yeah, I, I, I work in surgery. Oh, I thought you were a serial killer. Um, <laughs> no. N- n- of course not. No serial killers have a medical background. That's just not how it works. No. Well, my grandfather had his circumcision done when he was like 73. Oh, Lord, no. <laughs> Do we do we have anything else to say about this? Uh... But everyone else sounds robotic. Oh gosh. oh gosh, Matt, Matt, it's your chapter. Wake up, but Matt. It just sounded it's like Christmas a Day. It's Christmas Day, Matt. <laughs> Wake up. <laughs> ah. oh. <laughs> Matt, it's a festivus for the rest of us. But I really want Seinfeld Westeros cast to be a thing, though. Like, it's all I can think about at this point. So. Uh, you know what? That could be like a 20-minute, like, Westeros, Seinfeld. Let's just get together Hello? and, you know. Yeah. Hey, oh, man. Uh, so does anyone have anything else to say what about I uh, Cat hey. 1 before we uh, move on? Oh, wait. Let's catch Matt up. I was telling them about how my grandfather was circumcised when he was 73. Oh! Because why? he was drunk. <laughs> because he was a drunk. And he stopped taking uh, care of his personal hygiene. Together. <laughs> And he was getting infections, so... Yeah, man, that stuff's a hassle. That stuff's a hassle. You just gotta get rid so, of them when they're born. Wait, wait a minute. So he needed to cut off his foreskin because he, he couldn't take care of his schmegla? Yep. Yeah, he was he was getting infections, so his urologist... He was a little schmorkin on his schmegla. He should get <laughs> a circumcision, and they put him to sleep for it. And But then he uh, had several days fun. of, like... I'm in the worst pain, I bet, so that sucks. Yeah, but he was a drunk, so he was numbing his pain anyway. Well, I'm sure they uh, painkillers too, but yeah. Yeah, but even so, drunks so, masturbate. Uh, what's the wait time on that? A long time. <laughs> Maybe if he just thought really hard about it. I don't know. All right, so so does anyone have anything else to say on <laughs> Cat 1 before we move on? <laughs> I think I'd just like to say I think I put the vision of uh, Hannah's grandfather masturbating into her head, and I don't think she likes it. All right not, then. So Sansa, not the, hey. best. <laughs> not, not the greatest. 
greatest. Oh. We oh. um <laughs> we uh we move on <laughs> to uh September eighteenth in King's Landing. Um for uh, Santa 8 of uh, Clash of Kings. And I believe that is Varley. Sorry, man. I'm trying to get it together here. Um, so I'm just going to read off of uh, Tower of the Hand because otherwise my... Oh, my God. My dog's farting. It's we'll do it awful. live. What's that? Otherwise, just, my, my recap of live. this chapter is just... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, just do it. <laughs> okay. So you do you. Matt, I really feel your pain okay. because our our little Frenchie too. Oh god damn. Oh my god, it's stinging the back of my head. It smells <laughs> There's a, there's another Seinfeld thing. He farted on my sister the other day and it was in her clothes. And I was like, Oh, it's like the BO episode on Seinfeld and she didn't know what I was talking about. I met this wildling this right. wildling, I can't remember her <laughs> name, but it rhymed with a part of the female anatomy. <laughs> Mova? <laughs> Mova? <laughs> oh, Dolores. Dolores. And I think she... Uh, okay. So, Matt. Joffrey and his court, including Cersei's various Lord Giles, Lady Tanda, Lolly's Follies, Jalaba, Joe, the High Septon, Dantos, and Moonboy, all gathered in the throne room. Uh, Sansa makes her way to the front of the gallery just as Lord Tywin rides in on his horse. Joffrey meets him at the base of the throne, names him savior of the city, and asks him to assume government, uh, governance of the realm. After Lord Tywin takes his seat, the heroes of the Battle of the Blackwater come forward one by one. First is Lord Mace, followed by his sons, uh, Loras and Garland. Joffrey moves to greet them and allows them each a boon from the throne. Loras has to be put on the king. Card. Mace asks for a seat on the small council, and Garland asks for uh, um, for Joffrey to marry Marjorie. Joffrey grants the first request. And following them are men of lesser rank who distinguish themselves: uh, Sir Philip Foot, who slew Bryce Caron, Lord Brune, who captured Sir John Fossaway and slew Sir Brian Fossaway and Sir Edwin Fossaway to earn him the nickname Lothar Apple Eater. Um, Willa, a man at arms who, in service to Sir, to Sir Harry's, who saved his master's life, and Jasmine Peckledon, a young squire who killed two knights and wounded another, and captured two more. Sir Philip is made Lord Philip and granted the Karen lands, rights, and incomes. Uh, Lothar is made a knight and promised land somewhere in the Riverlands. Jasmine is given a sword, a suit to play, a war horse, and the promise of knighthood when he comes of age. Willa is giving new weapons armor and the honor of his two sons being taken in as squire and page at Casterly Rock. Next came the captains, blah, blah, blah. Um, so it just keeps on going on like this. And then uh, Sansa goes to the Godswood, talk to Dantos, and Dantos is like, you dummy. He's not going to let you leave you alone. But uh, then Dantos gives her a hairnet that says, and this is like the best part of the chapter, that it represents justice, vengeance, and home. And that's it. The only couple of notes that I have from this chapter is that um, first, the difference between the show and the book, they, they really like, in, just as far as the show is very drab, and Martin really puts up like the colors of each sig sigil, like, you know, just like, it just seems like a very colorful kind of court going on. And, and the next is the horse takes a big dump and he calls it the homage. And yeah. just that uh, we see Baelish now getting, uh, you know, Harrenhal. And no, no one knows that. takes a big shit in the show. Yeah, but they don't call it a homage. Um, it's It goes without saying. Right. And so, but no one really knows what Peter Baelish did until later, right? Like that he helped arrange oh, yeah, the yeah, marriage yeah, yeah. archery. Yeah, no, I don't think at this point. Yeah, so. So besides that, we, I, I guess no, it's not our first view of Charlie. We, we don't get really a lot of new information. Just that, like, certain people were fucking badass. Uh, Lothar Brune, in the book, it says he cut through a half a dozen, uh, half a hundred Fossaway men to get to the Fossaways, two of which he killed, one he captured. That, that, that's like Lord of the Rings style, like carnage, like, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
And uh, so, anyway. So, yeah, and Sansa gets a hairnet, and she's like, what the fuck? I need a ship home, not a fucking hairnet, you dumb dick. Yeah, <laughs> and, he, yeah and he's like, he's like, this hairnet is justice and vengeance and escape. And home. And she's like, it is a fashionable accessory that is currently in style this season. I don't know what you mean. <laughs> um, like, he re- she really should have questioned that. But, uh, right. You know. Bina's like, why? And Bina, Bina wrote like, uh, why didn't he just? Why didn't she just ask? Uh, why is this uh, an instrument for justice and vengeance? I'm a little confused. Right. It's for flyaways, not for justice and vengeance. <laughs> hey, you know what flyaways are? Is that like a question that I should answer? Yeah. What are flyaways? What, what are, no, I'm like impressed that you know what they are. It's when girl's oh. hair gets all caught in the wind and like you know, yeah. even though. Let's be all hanging down. There's like one piece, like all helter skelter. See, you're very aware. I wasn't, <laughs> but that's wow. probably the uh, English language barrier thing. What do you call hairs that are out of place on a woman's head? Usually due to the wind. I don't know. <laughs> we don't have a specific word for this. They're French, so they always look great, and their hairs in place. Exactly. Duh. <laughs> Do you have duh in French? Um, nope. Not really. Mon They're so smart, they don't even have duh. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, yeah. how would someone She's use like, this? I would never have occasion to use that word. <laughs> well, we'll we, we also pick up a lot of things from English, so we kind of now say things like that, even, even though it's not French. Uh, at the beginning, and also we don't. Um, I mean, English is very. Uh, I mean, sounds. Um, how to say this? Uh, you make up words uh, using the sounds, and it's it's very um, full of imagery. Imagery, you know. And in French, we do that way less. We we don't use um, sort of single syllables to mean something usually so with that being said like do you read a translated version of the books or do you read the english books? uh both i i started in french and then i said uh no way i'm waiting a year for for book five and and then uh i i, I bought them in english so and now I'm, I'm waiting even more but uh <laughs> at least i can read them uh as soon as they get out how are the translations? Do you find them similar, or do you find them like? Um, so the 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 translator changed actually. So the first three books, four books, I don't know, are a really flowery language, like kind of medieval, way more than uh, Martin does, and and mm. then it, it got kind of. Uh, more normal language. I, I like both, actually. I, I, I really got into the book in French first, so it obviously didn't um, bother me too much, but it, it's really different. And I think they're doing a, an amazing job at um, translating the nouns, the, I mean, the, the nouns for the, the, the cities, the castles and stuff like that. It's, it's really a, kind of a, a poetic uh, thing to do and they're doing a good job with that. So what do you think about the chapter, though? <laughs> what chapter? <laughs> <laughs> My God, what was his name? Oh, man. Uh, so uh, let's... Uh, I think uh, the, 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 book official, the official part first. about this. Um, do, we, do we have anything else to say about Sansa and about any of these chapters in general? Anybody? Um... Yeah. No, that just this was a good uh, like kind of mic drop moment for Sansa where Dantos is like and home and that was like the end of her chapter. Like that's da, what the da, hair da, never. Da, da. Yeah. Just, oh. Jock, you have anything to say? Oh, he's bailed out, right? No. Oh, I thought he was back. No. Uh, oh, he's. Nymeria, Nimer- anything? Um, nope. All right. Well, let's uh, let's officially close this out then. So, um, just thank you guys. Like, stop and... making sense references oh, wait, I don't no, one, ah, shit. no one no one said that but um so uh <laughs> so yeah so thank you guys for joining me um and uh i believe bina will be hosting the next episode which is going to cover 
uh, September 28th of 299 through October 1st of 299, and that's going to be Arya 10, John 8, Jamie 2, Theon 6, and Bran 7, and that's mostly from uh, Clash of Kings with one Storm of Swords chapter in there with Jamie. Um, thank you very much. Thanks, Adam. I'm glad you made Yay. it. <laughs>